There are still so many questions and so many mysteries around the universe that we still cannot answer, such as the question of origin of different things. But one of the more important questions is actually in regards to life. Where exactly did life on planet Earth come from and how exactly did it start? Because by finding the origin of life on our planet, we might be able to finally figure out if life can actually exist around other planets, other galaxies and possibly around the universe as a whole. Because at the moment, even though the question is really simple, we still have trouble answering it. But because of studies like the ones we're going to be discussing today, we're slowly coming closer to that answer. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the very recent advances in the studies regarding RNA and the concept known as RNA world. The potential explanation to the origin of life, all life on our planet, and the potential explanation for how such life can actually, maybe, form on other planets. But to start, let's start with the basics. Inside everyone's bodies, and actually inside every single life cell on our planet, we obviously have things like DNA and RNA. And although a lot of you are probably familiar with the concept of DNA already, it's really what DNA creates that's a lot more important for our investigation that we're going to be talking about. All DNA molecules eventually create what's known as RNA molecules. In this case, we're talking about mRNA or messenger RNA. And these are basically chains of really complex molecules that kind of float around and eventually serve as a template to produce more complex proteins. Okay, let's try to visualize this using this amazing simulation from the University of Colorado that I've used for decades now. Here's the DNA molecule. Once in a while, this molecule is going to get a signal to create a new RNA molecule. And when this happens, another molecule attaches to the DNA and starts to create what we refer to as mRNA. So there it is, floating around, minding its own business. And by itself, that mRNA molecule right there literally represents the entire essence of life on our planet. Because as soon as it attaches to what's known as the ribosome, which is basically kind of like a printer device, the printer here is going to start producing what we refer to as a protein. This right here will then fold on itself, producing one of thousands of different proteins in our body. Or another way of thinking about this, if you were to imagine that you're a Lego structure, you contain approximately 80,000 to maybe 400,000 different Lego pieces, all produced in this relatively simple way. But the thing is, in theory, you don't even need a DNA at all. You can actually replicate everything just using the mRNA molecule, which then can maybe find its own way to self-replicate. As a matter of fact, there is a way for different RNA molecules to be created using other RNA, with certain bacteria even containing all the machinery needed for this. And so in theory, DNA is kind of redundant. It is important for life that's more complex, but for more simple life that's being developed, you don't technically need DNA. And because of this, for many decades now, a lot of microbiologists believe that life might have actually started from RNA itself that might have found a way to kind of self-replicate and eventually became more complex. This concept is known as the RNA world hypothesis, originally proposed by Alexander Rich back in the 60s. And since the RNA molecule and DNA molecule are pretty much the same in terms of molecular structures, there's really no reason to think otherwise. On top of this, since we've actually discovered all of these little pieces of RNA and DNA in different meteorites and a lot of other locations around the galaxy, it kind of makes sense to think that this could also maybe happen around other objects in the galaxy, with all this maybe even being extremely common everywhere. So obviously, trying to figure out if RNA can find a way to self-replicate and to then evolve even, is kind of important in order for us to try to understand the origin of life. As a matter of fact, the scientists even know that something called double-stranded RNA exists in nature as well, and this could have been that extra step that turned RNA molecules into DNA over time. On top of this, this piece right here that's basically responsible for creating the proteins, the piece known as the ribosome, is practically made out of RNA as well. So in theory, by taking RNA and by having it do a lot of different functions in a cell, you could kind of replace a lot of the function creating an actual cell. At least in theory. But how do you prove this? In this case, you need to conduct experiments. And we know that many different experiments have actually reached success to some extent. And I think one of the most iconic experiments was actually conducted by this wonderful person, Saul Spiegelman, the molecular biologist responsible for some really important DNA techniques, who back in the 60s conducted a very interesting experiment using RNA and created what we refer to as the Spiegelman's monster. Kind of like Frankenstein's monster, but in RNA. 
And his experiment was relatively simple. He borrowed some RNA molecules and certain machinery for the RNA replication from a typical bacteriophage, a virus that's essentially responsible for usually destroying different bacteria, while essentially removing all of the other machinery that would be present here otherwise. And he then placed all of this in a solution where he let these RNA molecules and the proteins responsible for their replication to evolve over time. And eventually this molecule started to actually evolve and change over time, shrinking and becoming smaller and smaller, eventually reaching the size that was approximately 1 20th of the original size, containing approximately 200 different pieces in it. And it stayed that way for a very long time, mostly because it was the most efficient and also the quickest way for the molecule to reproduce and to continue the process. So in other words, he created a kind of a miniature RNA world with nothing else needed in there. But obviously it lacked the complexity of a lot of other mechanisms inside the cells, so this was just a very interesting model. But this model inspired a lot of other scientists to continue the experiments for decades and decades. With the most exciting experiment conducted in the last decade being the one that we're talking about today from Japan. And the first step of this experiment started approximately a decade ago. Back in 2013, the scientists behind the original study developed an RNA molecule that also had an ability to create its own replication protein. And specifically, this RNA molecule would then create what's known as a replicase, which is a molecule that does exist in nature and many viruses use it actively, including the virus that's going around right now. With this then producing more copies of the RNA and then restarting the cycle. Although to make all of this work, they did have to borrow some of the ribosomes from some of the bacteria such as E. coli. In other words, not everything was created here originally. But what was interesting about this initial experiment is that they did create a system that would then self-replicate and would keep going for a very long time. And would even start showing signs of what you would call Darwinian evolution. So this was a pretty exciting experiment. But now they've conducted this for over 9 years and they reached a new stage. They've created a system that seems to create a lot of other, I guess you can call them organisms, or technically it's actually other RNA molecules that interact and co-evolve, with some even reaching more interesting roles. In this new experiment, their single RNA species that they started with first ended up evolving into something else. It created two different RNA molecules and also what seemed to be a parasite. With all this happening after only 120 cycles. But with time and with more cycles, things started to change even more. Within just 220 cycles, they already had 5 different types of molecules that seemed to do completely different things. I guess one way of saying this is that they developed 5 different species, although here we're just talking about molecules themselves. And interestingly enough, some of them were parasites, but some of them became very important for cooperation and collaboration. They even had at least one molecule that seemed to be really important for the development of everything else. They referred to it as a super cooperator. With all of this developing into more and more complex networks and essentially representing a kind of a miniature biological world. Although obviously an extremely simplified world. A world of molecules. With parasites and these collaborators being extremely intriguing. Because by removing one of the parasites, the entire process actually stopped. It looked like some of these parasites that were just stealing the material from other molecules were also important for the process of replication. Or in other words, this entire chain became completely interconnected with everything depending on everything else. And it was obviously growing more and more complex over time. Which in essence proves that in this experiment, RNA was not really competing with each other as much as it was collaborating. And it was even relying on each other even though certain relationships were kind of parasitic. Which proves a very important point that RNA can definitely serve as a potential source of early life. It seems to be able to replicate and evolve and even become more complex over time, within just about 300 cycles. In other words, it could have been a very important step for that early life on planet Earth and could have been that first step that life took on our planet in order to then evolve more complexity. But I guess interestingly enough, parasites seem to appear in every single case and collaboration was essential for everything. And removing parasites from the equation also stopped everything, destroying the entire process. And that's maybe something to think about when we think about eliminating certain things from the biosphere. Anyway, off topic. This is obviously still not the answer to everything, because there are still certain problems here. For example, we know that RNA is very fragile, as is DNA. So for all of this to survive long term, something else would have to happen in order to protect these molecules. On top of this, this, the ribosome, was also included in this particular equation. But what created the ribosome? 
In other words, what created the thing that creates the RNA afterwards? Where exactly did this come from? Now we know that you can make ribosomes out of RNA, but they still have to come from somewhere. And that's actually where this other study comes in that was only released a few weeks ago as well, where the scientists presented a different kind of an idea. It's possible that the initial formation of life didn't just come from RNA, but it came from a kind of a mixture of RNA and what the scientists refer to as peptides. The chains of amino acids that essentially all of the proteins are made from. And in this study, by combining RNA molecules and those amino acids, they were actually able to show that certain RNA molecules in certain conditions could actually print the longer chains of these peptides, creating a chain that would become longer and longer over time. Not super long, but as a proof of concept, this is definitely interesting. In other words, by combining RNA and the amino acids, and again, all of these were actually found in different meteorites already, and by putting them in certain conditions, in theory, it's possible to create a self-replicating world where everything seems to operate without the need for anything else. And in theory, it could evolve over time. Although it's important to understand that these are two separate studies with two separate results. In other words, we still don't really know how ribosomes were created and how they interacted with the early RNA molecules in order to produce a self-replicating and self-evolving system. But because of these several studies in the last few years, it seems to be more and more likely that this is maybe how life started on our planet, eventually evolving complexity over time and eventually producing more complexity and maybe even creating what we refer to as a cell. Although how that happened is another question we'll be answering in some of the future videos. Which by the way means that you should probably subscribe. Anyway, these two experiments are quite groundbreaking and they almost definitively prove two important things. RNA seems to be that important step for the origin of life on any planet. And it looks like it's very possible for all of this to happen elsewhere, assuming the right conditions such as temperature, presence of water and a lot of other things. But the only way for us to confirm all of this and to actually definitively be able to answer the question of origin of life is to go somewhere else and to find this on possibly another planet or another moon. And so by finding something there, we might be able to answer these questions once and for all. Until then though, it's still a hypothesis based on experimental evidence. But hopefully in the next few years, if we find some kind of extraterrestrial life somewhere in the solar system, we'll finally know exactly how all of this happened here on Earth. Until future studies and until future discoveries, thank you for watching, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.